Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. Hello, this is episode 33 of the Potential Psychology Podcast. Welcome. I'm Ellen, I'm your host, and I have been knee-deep the last week or so in productivity tips. Not the age-old to-do lists and tomato timer type productivity. What really lights my fire are productivity tips that take your well-being into account. And maybe counterintuitively, we do know now from positive psychology and brain-based research that we're actually at our most productive when we're happy and well, not stressed and overwhelmed and chained to the desk. And I know it's tempting to think that if you keep slogging away and persevering and just making yourself get it done, you'll eventually get to the bottom of that list. But it's not the case at all. In fact, Sean Acor, one of my favourite positive psychologists, has found that our brains are 31% more productive when we're feeling positive than when we're at either neutral or stressed. 31%, that is huge. So my tips that I've been gathering, my brain-based tips that I've been gathering for better productivity, are based on the things that not only make us more productive, but keep us happy and well, because that is the right order of things. So making sure that you get up from your desk, taking walks, uh, listening to music, doing things that make you happy, that will also then make you more productive. So I've been reading and researching and compiling the best tips that I can find and sharing these both on social media and also popping them into my newsletter. So I'm putting this together for a client for a workshop and I figured why not share it all around because it's really excellent stuff and it is all stuff that I use myself to keep me at my most productive, which I kind of need given the demands of this podcast and clients and everything else that I do. So if you're a subscriber to my newsletter, you've hopefully seen these already or perhaps you follow me on social media. Um, Thank you. If you do, if you're interested in subscribing, you can do that at potential.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm also going to be running a free webinar on the topic on Friday, the 15th of February, 2019, if you're interested and you want to amp up your productivity in a sustainable and positive way. And the webinar is tentatively called Six Ways to Create a Powerfully Productive Mind. But I must admit, the number of ways might change because I actually don't know how I'm going to choose just six. So uh, stay tuned for that. But the focus of the webinar will be on tips that keep your happiness and well-being at the fore while also significantly boosting your productivity and your sense of achievement because that's what makes us happy too. It's a virtuous cycle. So I'm going to pop the details of that and a registration link on the website, which is at potential.com.au. If you're interested in attending that webinar, you get to see me then as well as hear hear me. And I'll email it to all of my subscribers as well. So again, if you're not a subscriber to my newsletter, it's the easiest way to keep in touch and you can sign up at potential.com.au forward slash subscribe. And while we're talking about positive approaches to our tasks, my guest today is here to discuss positive approaches to parenting. And a bit like making the mental switch away from I must chain myself to my desk to get everything done to a more positive, sustainable approach, Professor Lee Waters advocates for a switch in the way we think about our approach to parenting. So let me introduce her properly. 
my guest today has entirely too many accomplishments, accolades and areas of work and passion to list them all. So I'm going to give you a few headlines. Professor Lee Waters is one of the world's leading experts on positive education, positive organisations and strength-based parenting and teaching. She's a psychologist, the president of the International Positive Psychology Association, the founding director of the Positive Psychology Centre at the University of Melbourne, a TEDx speaker and an author. She makes regular media appearances and has been named one of Westpac's 100 Women of Influence. Her book, The Strength Switch, How the New Science of Strength-Based Parenting Can Help Your Child and Your Teen to Flourish, is part of what we're going to talk about today, perhaps in the greater context of what it is to be a parent and how we can best not only parent our children, but manage ourselves and learn from that experience as well. Welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to have you here. I do know, as I was just saying to you before we hit record, that a number of my audience listening today know you. They may have seen you speak at schools. They may have read your book. And this is an opportunity for us to get to know you a little bit better and learn a bit more about strengths-based parenting and your approach and what you mean by that. So to set that up, Mm -hmm. what I'd love for you to do is just perhaps tell us how you came to this whole positive psychology, strengths-based work approach. Sure. Um, <laughs> I always get... It's a big question, it, I know. Totally, it is such a big question. It's like, all right, what, how do I tell the short version of this? Um, yeah. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that most people's careers are very much influenced by life outside of professional work. And certainly that has been the case for me. And um, I do talk about this a little bit in my book. At, um, my, my kind of my backstory, my journey, I grew up in a small regional town in Victoria, Australia, um, born in 1971. So we're talking kind of the 70s was raised by a mother who has a very severe mental illness. And so that, I mean, uh, the reason why I say I, when I was born, no woman likes to say that, do they? But <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I was 72. I'm not far behind right, you. <laughs> snap. Um, apparently 50s is a new 40s. So we're, we're, we're okay. We're just about to hit the new 40s. Um, the reason why I mentioned it's the 70s, of course, is because it, they're just we didn't have the same level of community awareness around mental illness and mental health at that time. And so it was. It, my mum didn't get the help that she needed. There was no language. There was no. You didn't talk to people about it. Um, it was a. It was a sort of source of shame for the family. What that meant is that my mum didn't really get the help that she needed, and certainly that myself and my younger brother and my younger sister didn't get the help that we needed. And so from a young age, I guess. I experienced a lot of suffering. Mum was in and out of psychiatric institutions, multiple suicide attempts, and when she wasn't coping so well, was quite violent towards us. And that's an important part of where I ended up, why I chose to be a psychologist. I don't want to say that in any way to demonise my mother. I have compassion for uh, her suffering. Um, I'm actually not in relationship with my parents any anymore, and that that was a long and hard decision uh to make so it sounds a little bit ironic that you know I focus on strength-based parenting and I do research at the university and I have this big large program on parenting and I've written a parenting book and but it's it's also the reason why I do what I do and I wasn't able to sort of I guess help my own family but I can I can use my experience my formative experiences as a child and and now my experiences now, you know, as a mom, 15-year-old son and an 11-year-old daughter and um, to take this really great science, the science of positive psychology and help people apply it in ways that creates positive outcomes. And I'm talking about outcomes like, you know, trust within a family, safety within a family, but but also up that, that high end, how do we harness and utilise those individual quirks and qualities that each of us have maybe as a mother or a father, as a son or a daughter? How do we make the most of the strengths that we have to create just a happy family experience? I mean, families, apart from school and workplace, it's, it's the place where we spend the most of our time. And so many people are struggling within their families. They, they might have the more extreme version that, that I've had or just everyday stress, struggles, conflict. And the science of positive psychology has a lot to say about that, a lot to help us kind of not only fix what's wrong, but move out of that and build up what's right within our family. Every family has their strengths. 
And we tend to think that the way to fix a family is to kind of work on the weakness. But my research shows that if we spend more of our time identifying what's right with the family and the strengths in the family and building those up, that that's actually ultimately a more effective way of solving family problems. When you focus on problem you just and you fix the problem, you may be successful and then, then all you are is a family who no longer has problems. Yeah. But that's not the same as a family who has strengths and joy and happiness and trust and love and enjoys each other's company. They're different things. It's the difference between perhaps a, a family that's operating at okay, hmm. surviving, and a family that is operating at thriving and flourishing. Yeah. And, you know, I want to kind of say up front that I'm not trying to create perfect families or ideal families. No, no one thrives all of the time. But you can get yourself there more often and you can have those outcomes that we want as parents to, to have harmony, to have, to like each other, to enjoy each other's company, to enable each other, uplift each other. I just, as I'm saying that out loud, I just a little kind of my own family moment. We've got a new puppy. Her name's Peppa. She's a gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> now, our new family member. So she, her name's Peppa because um, she's got a black coat. So my daughter Emily called her Peppa. My son now is agitating for a second one that's white, so we can call it salt. <laughs> <laughs> to get the, yeah, the man. We need salt and pepper. Um, so Pepper is little and she's being trained and the other day she she wanted to do something that she wasn't allowed to and she was whinging and uh, and I, my daughter didn't notice. I was in the kitchen. I heard her out in the back deck. And she was, she was setting the boundaries, but she picked Pepper up and she said, you know what, you shouldn't whinge because you're so lucky that you belong to this family. It was this beautiful little moment where I was like, wow, you know, I have this 11-year-old daughter who, who is proud of her family and who is saying to this new member, like, you're lucky, you, you got a good one. You know? us. <laughs> and, and it was one of those little moments as a mum where I'm like, all right, we're on track, we're doing all right here. And, but that's not to say that my daughter is, says that all of the time and there's certainly times mm. where she's like, mum, it's not fair, how come I don't get as much screen time as other people or... Um, why are you making me eat vegetables or you're not listening or you're you're on your computer too much? Or, so, yeah. So it's about the good moments outnumbering the bad maybe. It's it, That's exactly what it is. It's just a proportional thing and that's what the strength switch is about. It's not saying we should only focus on strength at the and we should ignore weaknesses. It's just about the proportion of time and energy where you place as a parent, what proportion of your time is placed on fixing weakness, um, and dealing with what's wrong and what proportion of your time is focused on building up strengths and amplifying the positive qualities in a family. So, Lee, what, because strengths is a term that you and I are very comfortable with. It's the area in which we work. So we kind of know what we're talking about, but I'm conscious that perhaps not everyone knows what we mean when we talk about a strength. Can you describe it for us? Absolutely. And that's probably a really good <laughs> question for you to to start with because yeah I do sort of make that assumption in my field well I mean it's funny because I do a lot of work with schools and you ask little kids what do you think a strength is and the first thing they do is they kind of like raise up their arm and they show you their biceps and, and <laughs> real, yeah they think about it as physical strengths absolutely we have physical strengths but we also have intellectual strengths we have emotional strengths we have relationship strengths so really a strength is a positive quality that helps you to feel good and function well and scientifically there are sort of three elements that that psychologists like myself would say we need in order for something to be classified as a strength and the first element is performance so a strength is something that you're good at it's something that you, you comes quite naturally to you you know so some children are have a strength you know they're very good artists or musicians they're, they're good at it. it comes naturally they perform well they have it and you'll know in your own child if you're seeing an inkling of a strength because they will be performing above age appropriate levels they'll learn really really quickly they have a very very fast learning curve mm -hmm. so you know some kids it's sport some kids it's art some kids it's music some kids it's more like the kind of emotional strengths you know they they have this like kind of wisdom or emotional intelligence above and beyond their years or they're just supremely kind or ridiculously brave more so than you would expect for someone <laughs> yep. their age and probably yep. braver than most of the adults that you know so that's the first element is performance that they're good at it the second element is energy so we know we're using a strength when we feel energized 
when we're using that strength, it's a sort of this internal feedback loop. So indications of, of energy is you see it in, you'll see it in the posture of your children, you'll hear it in their voice, you'll see it in their facial expressions. They're kind of really like buzzed and jazzed as a result of the fact that they get to do whatever it is, you know, go and play netball or have some time with friends or work on a creative project. And then the third element is youth, self-motivation. We, mm-hmm. Because we are, the evolutionary psychologists and the developmental psychologists have helped us to understand that strengths are partly nature and, and partly nurture. So roughly, it depends on the strength, but roughly 50%. So you can't, everyone's born with their own inherent strengths potential. Some people are really articulate. You know, they're fantastic debaters. They're great conversationalists. And they're sort of born that way. You know? And the interesting thing is when you're a parent is that, you know, you when you start to look at your kids from the lens of strength and then you see your three-year-old or four-year-old who, who's constantly talking and constantly asking you questions, and you're like, oh, my God, you know, can you just give me a minute's peace? And then you realise, actually, this is a strength. I have a seven-year-old like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Lots of words. Yeah. And, <laughs> All the words. And it's a great strength. And, and so, you know, it's, it's about us as parents teaching our kids how to utilise their strengths in a way that work for them, not against them. Mm-hmm. So that third element is use and self-motivation. If it's a natural strength, then your kids will, you won't have to sort of nag them to do it. They'll just naturally do it. They'll want to do it. So from a psychology perspective, a strength then is something where we perform well, we get energy from, and we, we're self-motivated to do it. Mm-hmm. And without getting too technical, the reason why those three elements are important is because most of us, when we think about strengths, we think it's something that I'm good at and yeah. we leave it there. Now, the danger of that, the risk of that in parenting is that we might see our children show an aptitude for something. They might be good at it, but it's not necessarily a strength. Unless they're getting the energy and the self-motivation piece from it, then what we would, in in psychology, we would call that a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So a learned behavior is something that we learn to do. We're good at it. We have an aptitude for it, but it's not something that we feel joy when we're doing it. It's not something that gives us energy. And I'll give you a a concrete example from my life just to sort of make that concrete for people is um, in my role at the university, having been there for 22 years and sort of climbed the corporate ladder, so to speak, now at the professor level, I get asked to chair a lot of meetings and that's part of just part of my role. But I also get asked to chair a lot of meetings because people say, well, you're good at it. It's a strength of yours. And the truth of the matter is I've learned to be good at it. It's a learned behavior because I... I actually don't like long meetings, so I'm very like an hour, anything more than an hour is not a productive meeting. And I'm a trained psychologist and I'm conscientious. So, you know, I set an agenda, I get us organized, I read social dynamics. So it's a learned behavior. Like I I am quite good at chairing meetings. And because Mm. of that, then University of Melbourne says, well, that's a strength of yours. You should do that more often. And I'm like, Mm. it's not actually a strength. I don't get energy (laughs) from it. I don't leave those meetings feeling energized compared to some of my other other colleagues who love it. It is a true strength. They really Mm. get energized by chairing these meetings. It's not a true strength of mine. I don't get energized. I'm not self-motivated. I wouldn't choose to do these. If my dean sat down with me tomorrow and said, Lee, craft out your ideal job description, I can tell you right now we would not have chairing meetings in the ideal job description. So it's, it's important to understand things that you're good at are not necessarily strengths. They can be learned behaviours. And so then bringing that into the role of a parent, when you see signs of aptitude in your son or your daughter and they're good at it, just being wary of pushing them into something because you think it's a strength just because they're showing that performance element. You really need to tune into, are you seeing energy? Are you seeing self-motivation? Are you seeing intrinsic? You know, are they choosing to do it without you having to ask? Do they yearn to do it? Are they out the back shooting baskets? in any kind of spare moment and what are their energy levels like do they get lost in it you know are you the person who has to say come on and they're like wow I didn't realize I've been doing this for two hours those other elements are more invisible but they're really important okay it's interesting that you say that and to use the baskets example because I have a a 10 year old who plays basketball and we just spent the weekend he's playing at a reasonably high level for our town Mm. Um, so we spent the weekend at a basketball tournament and there's 20 kids in our squad and, and, you know, all these different teams from all the regional locations. Yeah. And these kids, you know, yes, they have an aptitude. That's why they're in the team. You know, they're playing at a, a decent standard for their age. Mm. They not only 
were there as soon as they arrived, got out of the car, they're all out there with their basketballs. They find a court and a ring, they find yeah. each other and they've started, you know, in between games. When they're not on the court yeah. themselves, they want to watch the others playing. You know, if yeah. if we could have said, right, you just stay here in this stadium, we'll just feed you the odd. <laughs> They literally would have played basketball with each other and watched basketball yeah. and probably talked about basketball mm. for the entire weekend. You know, you almost have to drag them and sometimes we do almost literally <laughs> drag him away. So, yeah, I can see what you mean there about that that self-motivation piece. There's no nobody ever has to tell these kids you need to go train. Yeah. You know, they are there with bells on the moment the opportunity arises. They, you know, mine's out the back. I'm sure all his his teammates are out in their yard or in their driveway. It's a beautiful example, Ellen. And the thing about strengths is because they are they're partly nature, they're partly nurture. They are you, each of your children and you yourself as an individual and your partner and even honestly the people who are at work who annoy you. <laughs> everyone has strengths. And so, I mean, one of the lovely parts about strength-based parenting is it's, and I talk about this in the book, it's a little bit like mining for gold that you know is already there or panning for gold mm-hmm. that you know is already there, which, you know, obviously from Ballarat. Yep. That's Very a, that's appropriate a, example. Yeah, it's an appropriate <laughs> little saying for me to have. But yeah, you know, it, you, you're kind of working with what's there. And I think one of the joys of taking this approach, and I, I'll say this as, a, as my, I've taken this approach with my own two children. So, that, so the joy I have just as a mother um, let alone the sort of joy I see in the parents who are adopting this and, and what what the science is kind of informing us with is that a lot of the parenting approaches are, are sort of about compensating for what's lacking, compensating for what's missing, like what's not in your child and how do I shore up my child to make sure that they're kind of okay. And strength-based parenting is it's like the flip side of the coin. It's not about ignoring problem behaviours. It's not, you know, if, if your kid needs extra tutoring, you should absolutely be doing that. If, if you're my 15 year old right now is being a 15 year old. So there's some behavioral things that like, I'm not, I'm not ignoring the fact that he plays too much PS4. I'm not ignoring his kind of um, sometimes sassy, impatient demeanor towards his parents. I'm not ignoring any of that, but my attention is first and foremost on what's already there. And that's the joy of taking strength-based parenting approaches that you you don't have to invent it. It's already in your child. So your beautiful Mm -hmm. example of your son with basketball and that whole team and how, you know, they're just this, they've got the performance element, obviously, because he's been selected into that level. But clearly you're seeing the energy and the self-motivation piece as well. The, the little question mark comes about when your example is a really like perfect sort of textbook example. But a lot of parents ask me, well, what if I don't see those three things so clearly, you know? And, mm. and the answer to that is just, you know, stay tuned as a parent. So sometimes you might see the performance piece. You're not quite seeing the energy and the self-use, but if but they feed into each other. You know, so keep them going with the piano because once they start to get a sense of mastery, then the energy and that self-motivation might come. Or it might start first with an interest and there's not so much performance or talent, but keep nurturing the interest because through practice that 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 talent will grow. Mm. And I can imagine as a parent, that's a, there's a balancing act in there, isn't there? Because you don't want, if you've got a child, you know, to use the piano example, mm. who shows an aptitude and, and some level of interest, but then doesn't want to practice, you know, because that's boring yeah. or mm-hmm. <laughs> wanting to be able to encourage that aptitude so that they can perhaps gain that sense of mastery and competence that we know then fuels motivation yes. without wanting to destroy any passion that might be there because of, a sense that they're nagging. It's such a delicate balance. And this is where you take the strength-based approach and then you just take on the normal kind of wisdom of like, what's a sensible approach here as a parent? And and so it's about creating rhythm and routine. It's about encouraging your kids. And even in that moment, sharing, yeah, you know what, I have to do this thing at work and I don't really like doing it either. But you know, <laughs> it's kind of part of life and you'll feel better about yourself once you've done it. And you'll remember how you felt when you mastered this particular song and you played it for me and it was beautiful and I, you, you felt so good. I could see that you were energised, you had a smile on your face. Well, now you're just in a little moment where you're playing something a little bit harder. So giving them that like image of the future but also letting them know that there are just some parts of life that aren't always enjoyable and we have to get ourselves through them and the music is the sort of portal but what they're learning through that is grit, perseverance, persistence, not turning it into an argument, you know, so 
Mm. Look, this is part of the deal. We're paying for your lessons. This is what's happening. You know, you've committed to this. But if it's really that moment where it's going to make them hate music, then just pull back as a parent and say, okay, tonight's not the night. Let's go and do something fun. We'll do it tomorrow yeah. night. And, and yeah. I think that's one of the things about parenting. And I have to tell myself this so much is that um, it's a long journey. Yeah, we've got time. We've got time. Mm. So we can mm. pull back from those moments and we can come back tomorrow. Or we can come back next week. It can be an ongoing conversation. Yeah, and not a battle. Yeah. <laughs> so, Lee, what are the benefits? We talked about what strengths are and how a parent might identify them in their child. What What is the benefit of doing this, firstly, for the child? Mm-hmm. Great question. And so that's one of the that's one of the kind of the major research programs that we've been running out of the University of Melbourne. And and there are you know a host of benefits. The, the key ones are around the mental health, mental health and identity of young children. And so what we're finding is that children who uh, young children and teenagers who have strength based parents are uh, have high levels of self confidence, high levels of life satisfaction, high levels of uh, happiness, high levels of persistence, high levels of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy meaning that, you know, they have a kind of internal belief that that I have mastery and control over my world. You know, if I put effort into basketball or studies or friendships or, you know, developing my creative skills, my fashion sense, whatever it happens to be, that that effort will pay off. So they have higher levels of all of these kind of positive indicators of mental health. They also have lower levels of stress lower levels of depression, lower levels of anxiety, lower levels of sort of low-level negative emotions. And it's always really, really nice to have that science behind it. But I think so much of it, it just comes down to common sense. If you put yourself in the shoes of a young person who is being raised by parents who help them to see and utilise, you know, you have these particular strengths. You're good at basketball. You've got the gift of the gab. You're kind. You're creative. You know, you've got really keen observational skills. You notice things that other people don't notice. Whatever it happens to be, they're all, you know, every every child is born with their own constellation. If you've got a parent pointing that out to you, it's not that it just makes you feel good about yourself. What they're doing is they're helping you to utilise those skills. And so in moments of stress, frustration, friendship issues, homework challenges, they, they realise, oh, you know what, I've sort of got this internal resource. I've got this inner toolkit. I can draw on my persistence. I can draw on my humour you know, in a moment of stress to make everyone laugh. I can draw on mm. my creative abilities. I can draw on my observational skills. I can talk my way out of this particular situation, whatever it happens to be. So you're really instilling this sense of like, I've got something that's positive and it's useful. I can use it in challenge. And also I can use it when things are going well. I can use it to set goals. I can use it when when I'm having a great time with my friends. I can use it when I'm enjoying a class. And so where I think strengths have their value is that they're very concrete and we can utilise them. And I suppose because I'm in the field of positive psychology, I've spent a long time listening to and genuinely understanding that some people have a bit of a reaction to the fe- a negative reaction to the field of positive psychology because they hear the word positive and they feel like it's it's a bit artificial, it's kind of blind optimism. Pollyanna. Yeah, Pollyanna. I've, I was called the Pollyanna psychologist for a long time. <laughs> But strengths are positive qualities. That doesn't mean that you use them in a sort of artificially blind, optimistic way. I think the greatest power of strengths, and I've seen this with my own two children, is in their times of stress and challenge and how it is that they realise, like, I'm not unequipped here. I've got things that I can do and I was born with them and these are, these are qualities that I can use that can help me in this situation. So how might we contrast this? Because I know this helps sometimes to understand these notions. How might we contrast that with, say, a weakness, mm-hmm. but, you know, to use the, the best term I suppose I can yeah. come up with, but a weakness type approach to parenting and, and what the impact that might have on kids? I think many, our default mechanism, even if we love our children, our default is to be be more weight oriented and, and again in the book I've got a whole chapter on sort of the biology of our brain and why it is that we mm. we can love our kids so much and yet we zoom in on what's wrong with them and what do we need to fix and we have all these hot buttons and they annoy us and that's to do with the, the biology of our brain and our own negativity bias which is a kind of evolutionary bias that means that our brain programs us to spot what's going wrong in the environment more quickly than what's going right in the environment 
because that that provided us with a survival advantage. If you imagine our ancestors out on the savannah, the brain that was quickly able to detect a little noise of a rustle in the bush or or an odor that didn't smell right, the brain that had that early detection for what's going wrong in the environment survived. The brain that didn't didn't survive. <laughs> Got eaten by something. Yeah, exactly. Someone's lunch. So <laughs> we have this inbuilt negativity bias, and it's a very effective mechanism for us for a survival. It's not the not, not the most helpful feature in our brain for being a positive parent <laughs> because we're kind of our brain is directing us to our child and looking at well, you know, we need to whatever it is, fix their maths, fix their skills, fix their friendship abilities, you know, fix their ability to pay attention. And so that that is more kind of weakness oriented. I think a lot of us we, we we're doing it subconsciously because of the negativity bias in our brain. You know, that society also puts a lot of pressure on us as parents to have perfect children. So competitive these days. You know, I remember when my two kids were little, kind of early primary school, and. Um, that, that pressure to overstructure my kids to have them doing a thousand different musical instruments and sport and this and that and everything else and and I knew as a psychologist actually this is not the right way to go it's going to mm. overwhelm my children they'll get no brown downtime like I knew the the kind of neurobiology behind it but I still felt so much pressure as a parent and it's not that individual parents were putting pressure on me but they were rushing mm. off here and there and you know there's advertising and social so- context yeah, so we've got the brain itself having a negativity bias. We've got society telling us, you know, make sure your kids are perfect at everything. And then I think we've just got our own fears as parents. And again, I talk about this in the book, like, you know, kind of a projection. And we, what we want is we, we want our kids to be liked. We want them to be accepted. We want them to be happy. We want them to feel good about our, themselves. And so maybe because of the way that our era was raised, we think that, the way to do that, you know, that, that ultimately they'll like themselves, feel good about themselves, be socially accepted if they're if there's nothing wrong with them because then no one can pick on them. And mm. what my research does is it kind of flips that on the head and says ultimately the way that your child will like themselves, feel good about themselves, find their niche is to actually help them amplify what's right with them. So we might we might feel like we need to kind of plug in the holes and fix in the the weaknesses and the the little bits that are a bit rough around the edges and we're doing it out of love but if you put yourself in the shoes of the child what they're hearing on a really regular basis is you know I love you but I need to fix you I love you but there's something wrong with you I love you but we need to fix this we need to do something about that and like it's conditional somehow. Yeah, and also kids have negativity bias as well. So they don't tune into the first part of the sentence, I love you. Mm. They tune into the, there's, there's something wrong with you. And we all do that. That's human nature. I think one of the most profound things that I've experienced just in working with parents in the workshops is they come along to, because they love their kids, they want to do the right thing by their kids. But invariably the conversation turns to their own childhood, their parents, and there's so much sadness. In, and maybe it's a self-selection effect, the type of parents who do my online course or read my book. Or I'm not so sure, though. I just think that we were, you know, we were raised in an era where the there was an assumption that improvement is a process of fixing what is wrong with you. And parents mm. may have lovingly wanted to improve their children, but the assumption was improvement is a process of what fixing what's wrong with you. And I think one of the biggest uh, kind of gifts of the field, the science of positive psychology over the last almost two decades, it'll be two decades old next next year, which is kind of fun because we're hosting the the World Congress of Positive Psychology is coming to yes. Melbourne next. I will next, be there. Yeah. Oh, cool. Make sure you come and say hello. <laughs> I will. So that's, it's sort of, I don't know, it seems nice and poetic that on the 20 year anniversary of the field that we're, that Australia is the country that's hosting the World Congress. But I think what I was saying is one of the biggest gifts of positive psychology is it's really questioned this assumption about improvement. Improvement doesn't just have to be a process of fixing what's wrong with us. Improvement can equally be a process of expanding and growing and building what is right with us. And society generally doesn't question that. You know, if I, I use this example, if I was your boss, Ellen, and we pass each other in the hallway at work and I said, you know, can you uh, make an appointment to come and see me on Friday? There's some areas of improvement. What would be your first response when you hear me say that? The automatic thought is, oh, my goodness, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> what yeah. am I getting wrong? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What is it? Let's do a bit of panic. 
<laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that to you. But that's because, you know, we've all been raised with the assumption that improvement is a process of fixing what's wrong. So when I say to you, there's some areas for improvement that I'd like to talk through, you immediately think, oh, my God, where, where is my performance data low? What do, what do I need to do? How do I need to get better? And actually, the truth of the matter is I've looked at your performance data and I'm like, she's really good on client sales. Like she's kicking it compared to everyone else. So I'm gonna, I want to speak to her about like, what's her secret? Why is she go, so, mm. so good at client sales? Mm. How can she teach the rest of the team? Because she's clearly got some kind of like social skill or something. And as a boss, maybe I should, at the moment, she's only doing 20% of her time on that. And maybe I should be recrafting her role so that 30% of her time is on client sales because mm. this is a strength of hers. So, you know, I just use that example to identify that even loving parents, we're taught to believe that we, w- we want to improve our children and we want to do it because you know, we want to make sure that they grow up to be good-hearted, happy, successful individuals. And in order to do that, we need to improve them. The question is, how much of the time do we spend improving what's wrong with them, or what's missing? How much of the time do we spend improving what's right with them? And mm-hmm. Because of our negativity bias, because of pressure in society, because of the way we were raised, because of this implicit and unquestioned assumption that improvement is a process of fixing what's wrong with us, we naturally go towards that more kind of deficit-oriented, weakness-oriented way of approaching. And it doesn't mean we don't love our children. It's just for all of those reasons. And and, and I feel like I want to apologize because that was a really long answer to your question. <laughs> why <laughs> what is weakness oriented parenting and why do we do it so often? But it's it's com- it's complex. And I I think it's really well, I know it's really helpful for parents to understand that. And I know um, I catch myself in that moment gravitating first towards what's wrong mm. before I focus on what's right. And I know the you know, parents I've worked with, so many of them have come up and said it's really helpful for me to understand like what I'm working against. So because then you don't judge yourself. You don't think, oh, why am I always such this nagging Nelly police officer, correction officer, parent? Because you understand actually like we're fighting against a lot of forces to shift our attention. That's why I call the book The Strength Switch because it really is. It's an intentional switch. Mm. You have to make an intentional choice to say I'm going to switch my attention. I'm going to focus first on what is right before I focus on what is wrong. And it's not just a one-off choice. You don't just sort of wake up one morning and say, right, I flicked the switch. <laughs> From here on in, I am a strength-based parent because, <laughs> you know, it's parenting. It's, it's like you've got your own real-life lab mm. and you get it wrong and you muck up. And what I've learned to do in my own parenting journey and, you know, what I advise parents to do is that when you do, those moments where you have been deficit-oriented first, don't get down on yourself to say, okay, well, this is a chance to practice. This is a do-over. Apologize. I think it's so powerful for parents, for children, for parents to be able to say, you know what, I mucked that up. I got that wrong. I wish I hadn't handled it that way. I'm really sorry about that. That's so important for a young person to hear and so empowering for them because then it teaches them you're allowed to make mistakes. You acknowledge your mistake, you say sorry, and you repair the relationship. And that's such a helpful skill for them to learn with their teachers, with their friends, you know, and then when they grow up as well. So it's a very dynamic thing, strength-based parenting. But what I will say is every time you practice it, every time you get it right, you're building new neural networks in your brain. So it really, really, it's just a skill set. It becomes Mm -hmm. easier and easier and easier with, and soon you'll just be doing it automatically. And what will happen is all your kids' friends love hanging out at your place (laughs) because You know, and it's again, it's not this Pollyanna psychologist. You're not being artificial with them, but you really you, you can spot. Wow, this this friend has this strength. This friend mm. has that strength. This mm. friend, and you're able to acknowledge it. Mm. And I think um, that point you made about the the neural pathways. You know, I, one of the challenges, I guess, for parents, and I'm going to ask you in a moment about the benefits of this approach for parents too. Mm. Mm-hmm. But is that you know we're not only hardwired, but we just have these habits of thinking. You know, we've, we've done it a certain way. We've picked up on those things that are going wrong for so long, 20, 30, 40 more years, yeah. and it takes practice to kind of rewire those thinking habits, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, absolutely. And mm. so this is where, you know, it's an intentional thing. It takes practice. It requires work to begin with. It's so worth it though, because the work that you do, in addition to becoming easier over time, going back to that message of, I love you, but I need to fix you. 
well, that becomes 20% of the time you speak to your kids and the 80% of your time is I love you and mm. I really I, I admire this quality in you, mm. let's build it up. And it's yeah. a very different message for a child and it's worth it. Like we said, the science is finding that young children who have parents who are strength-based just do better. They have just much more robust mental health. Mm. And so what are the benefits of this approach for the parents, we talked about the kind of what we need to do and how we kind of need to practice and, and test this and, and learn it ourselves. But mm. are there benefits for us as parents in, in flicking this switch? Such a worthwhile question. The short answer is yes. And I'll tell you why I think the question is worthwhile. When I first got pregnant with Nick, because of my own childhood, I really, I didn't have role models for parents. I knew I wanted to do it really radically different but I didn't have that sort of inbuilt knowledge or model. And so uh, honestly, I can tell you, I read every single parenting book <laughs> that was on the market. It's a diligent psychologist in you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and one of my strengths is conscientiousness, you know, and I'm an academic, I like learning. So I read everything and I ended up feeling pretty stressed, to be honest, and overwhelmed. And so I was doing the right thing by my children, but it was causing stress to me. Mm. And so, uh, you know, one of the one of the questions, of course, around strength-based parenting is we know it's good for the children. Is it is it good for the parent? And for the same reasons that it's good for your kids, their research is showing us it's good for you as an individual. Because when you learn to identify your strengths, boost your sense of confidence in the parenting role, it boosts your sense of self-efficacy. You start to bring your strengths more into that the moment of parenting and you become more authentic, you become more relaxed, you're performing better, you have energy, you're self-motivated. Formally, what the research is showing us is that parents who take a strength-based parenting approach have higher levels of positive emotions towards their children and have higher levels of confidence in their role as a parent. Informally, what I've seen happen is parents are much more engaged, they have more energy, they have more confidence, they have more less stress. But also what starts to happen is it changes the dynamics within the family. So the kids start to acknowledge and see their parents' strengths. And so it creates this really lovely relational glue where most children, they're born in a way where they just love, they're imprinted. They love their parents no matter what until they become teenagers. And then, you know, they still love their parents, but they start to kind of like critique. And that's natural. That's a normal process. And it's actually an important process because that's when the teenager is individuating and they're starting to really craft, oh, this is my own individual identity as separate and different to my parents. So where I've seen that informally strengths creates that glue is that teenagers are still doing that, but they're able to kind of, individuation is about just saying, I'm a separate individual to you. Now, the natural process is that teenagers do that by criticizing their parent. When you take a strength-based approach, the teenagers can say, I'm a separate person to you because I have this particular strength. Mm-hmm. You have that particular strength. Yep. So you're, you're allowing that natural psychological process of individuation to occur, but it doesn't have to be so judgmental and mm. critical. Mm. It's not such a battle. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that is something that my observation, my kids aren't quite there yet. My oldest is 10, but mm-hmm. certainly surrounding me are parents who are entering that those teenage years. Yeah. And I, I think even just part of our kind of I don't know whether it's just the conversation is that, oh, teenagers, you know, that it's hard work, that it's a battle, that there is this criticism, there's lots of eye roll, you know, this kind of idea of what teenage years are like. Yeah. And I think, A, that point about that individuation, the fact that this is an important part of their development, that they do start to kind of separate, that they pull away, that they recognise themselves as different. Mm. But being able to see some positives in that and in the way that, could happen rather than it having to be a constant battle because you can kind of see how that sets itself. You know, the teenager starts to become critical of a parent as, as mm. part of that developmental process and then the parent becomes critical in return and it, yeah. it just escalates, doesn't it? Absolutely. And it's, it's just a dynamic. Every action has an opposite and equal reaction, you know. So when your teenager is feeling criticised by you, they criticise you back mm. and then you feel criticised and then so it creates this kind of downward spiral when when the teenager feels that you know you see their strengths then they're more likely to see yours and also you're owning your strengths as a strength-based parent you're saying okay this is a this is a moment where I can use my problem solving abilities or this is a moment where I can draw on my patience or this is a moment where I can um, use my humor to deflect and deflate a situation whatever you know every all my kindness whatever your own strengths are 
and you know you're going to perform it better. You're going to be more effective as a parent. And in the book, I talk about strength-based discipline. And I think that's a really important part too, is being able to reframe that problem behavior in a way where it's not necessarily coming from a bad place, but maybe it's an overuse or an underuse of a particular strength. You know, so you've got a child who's really curious, but they're overusing their strength and it's making them become kind of nosy. And or you've got a child who has natural leadership skills, but they're overusing their strength and they're becoming very bossy. Mm. You've got the child who's like naturally humorous, who's maybe using their strength in a way that they're not meaning for it to be, but it's coming across as being disrespectful. And so then it's not that you're saying, you know, stop being bossy, stop being nosy, you know, stop being so disrespectful. It's like, you know, I really love your humour. I love it. But when when you used it in that situation, you might not have meant it, but it came across as, mm-hmm. you know. So you're, it's just it's a different way of teaching them how to behave and use their strength in a way that's good for them. And mm-hmm. it's a very different message from your bad. You're lazy, you know, you're bossy, you're nosy, you're disrespectful. Mm. It's a very different message to say, you know, you've got this strength, but when you you overplay it, it comes across in this way Mm. because Mm. you're providing them with an access out. It sounds like the conversation I'm having with my seven-year-old about his um, strength of talking. (laughs) (laughs) And we do, we have that conversation, you know, I, I know that you've got lots of ideas going around in your head and I know that you really like to be able to talk and tell people what you're thinking. And I know that you love words and using lots mm. of words. Yeah. When you do that in your class all the time, other people mm. don't get a chance to think because all they can yeah. hear is you talking. So mm. trying to frame it up in that way so that yeah. it's not just stop talking, it's bad. And, and also I suppose yeah. for me it's tapping into that motivation of the why. You know, why yeah. is it I'm asking you to do this? It's not because it's necessarily the wrong thing to do. It's just not the most helpful thing to do in that context. Yeah, right right place, right time, right Mm. reason. And Mm. that's just a like, again, going back to that idea, this isn't necessarily about strength-based parenting, but just the general wisdom of like that's one of the things that we teach our kids, right place, right time, right reason in any different context. And I think what, I mean, in that little scenario that you're talking about, Ellen, you're also drawing on a second strength of your son, which is his kindness. You're letting him know, like, it's great that you've got lots of ideas and it's great that you use words and you want to share those with people. But be kind. You need to let other people have some airspace as well. Hmm. So you're 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 motivating him through a second strength, which is his kindness to say, oh, now's the time to stop and listen to someone else. Hmm. Hmm. So we talked at the beginning, Lee, about how you might notice, observe, you know, those those three things to identify strengths in your mm-hmm. kids, their, their performance, their energy and their use and that intrinsic motivation. Are there other tools, and particularly for parents, if they're struggling to uncover their own strengths, are there particular Mm -hmm. tools that you recommend for people to use? I have a bunch of free things on my website. Mm -hmm. I'll point people in that direction. Yeah, so we've got links to the Values in Action survey. That's a free survey that parents can do to identify what their strengths are. That survey is also freely available for children over the age of 10. I have videos on the website of parents talking about how they identified and use their strengths, likewise for kids and teenagers. We have some fun games on the website. We've got like strengths bingo and instead of snakes and ladders, we've got strengths and ladders. So different ways of the, the most powerful way of doing it is this strength spotting. And that is being present as a parent and tuning into where do I see signs of performance, energy and use. But above and beyond that, there there are surveys that you can do that start the conversation. There are games you can play. There are conversations that you can have modelling off other people. A great thing as a parent is to take notice of your kids' heroes. Who are your kids' heroes? Who do they talk about? Is it a pop singer? Is it a sports singer? Is it a local teacher? You know, who are their friends? And start to tune into, well, what are the strengths that you see in their heroes, in their friends, in their teachers, in the people that they talk about? And spot the strengths in those as well. So, yeah, there's a, there's a range of different ways of doing it. And like I said earlier, the, the key thing is just to practice, practice, practice and know that you'll, you're you not going to get it right every single time. And when you don't, that's just a chance to, to, to redo it again. I talk about to my own kids, I narrate it like, oh, okay, this is a time where I really need to draw on my patience or this is a time where humour is going to help me a lot. Or if I get things wrong, I'm like, oh, yep, forgot to use my problem-solving skills in that one. So uh, I use that as another way of kind of bringing strengths into the family. Questions. Questions is a great way of bringing strengths into your family because we ask our kids 
hundreds of questions every day, you know, like, what do you want on your breakfast? What, what it, have you packed your bags? What do you want to wear? What time shall I pick you up, et cetera, et cetera. So starting to bring strengths into the questions that you ask your children, instead of asking them, how was school today? Ask them, what strengths did you use at school today? If, they're, if they've got homework coming up, a big assignment, you know, what strengths do you think you'll need to help you do well in that assignment? If they're having friendship challenges, hey, what strengths do you think were missing when you had that fight with your friend? What strengths were missing in you or overplayed? What strengths were missing in your friend? What strengths do you have now to help repair that situation? Mm. So that's a really nice, easy, organic way to start to bring strengths into the dynamic of the family. And it's creating a language, isn't it? It's giving them the words to use so that they've got, and the words give us the ideas, you know, kind of cement the concepts for us. Yeah, spot on. Language is a priming tool. So, you know, Mm -hmm. we understand the world through the language, through the words that we hear described about ourselves and through the language that we use. And so the more you can start to introduce that strength-based language into your family and through your kids, the better. And the beautiful spill-on effect of that is that then those kids start to use that strength-based language with their friends. Yeah. So yeah. you see this lovely kind of spillover effect and positive ripple that's going out. Wonderful. Lee, you also have an online program that I do. parents can do. Can you tell us a little bit about the online program? Sure. Um, it's a lovely program. It's a five-week online course. So we start with understanding strengths and then we move to seeing strengths, using strengths, growing strengths, and then week five is celebrating strengths. Each week has a particular kind of rhythm. There's a rhythm to the week. So the first thing is a little online session with some videos for me. It's just for the parents. Like this is this is what we're focusing on. These are three key things. Here's a video. Here's a survey for you to do. The second part in each week is family time. So we have a whole lot of like exercises and worksheets and and beautiful pieces of artwork to download. So you can each children can you know fill in their five top strengths and that gets put on the refrigerator and uh, we have family time and then the third part which is optional is just like fun time on the weekend so we we have suggestions for conversations for for family movies to watch um youtubes there's just a whole lot of range of fun things like there's a family ancestry so you, you sit down with your family and you have a look at well who were my grandparents who were my cousins who were my great grandparents maybe they immigrated from ireland or Mm. wherever like what does that mean what so very interactive. I worked with an amazing graphic designer who's just made it look just, I have to say, beautiful. And one of my top strengths is appreciation of excellence and beauty. So anything that like aesthetically looks great, I'm like, oh, wow, that looks so good. <laughs> so it's an online course. Go to the website and then it all gets downloaded for you. Where I, That's been actually really fascinating for me to see. That course is now being used in like all across the world, we've got families in Switzerland, Ireland, Canada, UK, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, you name it. And it's just it's lovely for me to see this kind of movement of strength-based families and, and parents saying, well, we're going to commit ourselves to the next five weeks to like learning about strengths, doing the games, doing the surveys, infusing these in fun ways into our mm. family. Mm. I've always felt from my experience talking about positive psychology and and working in the field that we're kind of almost inherently drawn to this more positive way of doing things you know mm-hmm. if there's an opportunity and and I'm I'm guessing that the people who are enrolling in your course are people who are perhaps saying I feel like we could be doing this better somehow or I feel yeah. that you know that there, there's another way than the way that perhaps I was raised with or and the possibility of being able to do something that doesn't feel like hard work. I'm not saying yeah. there isn't hard work involved in this, but no, you know, it's it, joyous. It's natural, yeah, it, it's yeah. fun and it is positive and it's reinforcing good stuff within us that I think we are inherently drawn to. So I'm not surprised really, you know, once people have an awareness of this, that they would be excited about the possibilities of being able to um, to practice it and uh, with a bit of guidance from an expert in their own homes and with their families. Thank you. Yeah. It's been amazing to watch that go. I mean, it's sort of an interesting journey for me just as a psychologist to then sort of say, well, not everyone wants to read a book. Yeah, it's, that's not everyone's style. Yeah. And some people want to do it more interactively and some people want to do it like at home with fun things to do and so just finding different ways of getting that same message out and then kind of yeah seeing it take off across the world it's been a really uh, lovely thing to watch how many 
families are, are wanting to do it differently and, and to inject a bit of kind of love and strength and joy yeah, yeah. into family life. Wonderful. And wonderful to see, before we went on air, we were talking about, you know, getting psychology out there in different forms, yeah. in different ways out into the population, people perhaps who haven't necessarily accessed the tools because they haven't felt able to or even known that it was available. So mm. yeah, another exciting way and a relatively new way as well yeah. for uh, this content to be presented out there and made accessible in the world. Yes, exactly. Mm. Now, the book is called The Strength Switch, How the New Science of Strength-Based Parenting Can Help Your Child and Teen to Flourish, and it is available via Lee's website. I will put a link to the show notes, and it's also available in all good bookstores online and in the old-fashioned offline <laughs> bricks-and-mortar version. Yeah. And if you haven't read it already, then I would encourage you to get hold of it, and um, particularly if all the stuff that we've spoken about today really resonates with you as an opportunity perhaps to help your family to thrive and flourish in 2019. Lee, I know I will put a link to your website um, and to the online program and to the book has its own website, which is just strengthswitch.com. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. And I will put all of those details in there. Thank you so much. I, there's lots more I could ask you. There are so many other things. <laughs> talk about but perhaps we'll have you on another time to talk about some of those other topics yeah I'd love to thank you excellent and I, I really appreciate your time and sharing your wisdom knowledge and experience both of a professional nature but also of a personal nature with our audience today it's been a pleasure thank you so much very enjoyable conversation and anytime you want me back just let me know was Professor Lee Waters, psychologist, researcher, consultant, author and public speaker specialising in positive psychology and positive education. You can find out more about Lee via her website, Lee, that's L-E-A, waters.com. And you can find her online parenting program that we talked about and, of course, her book, The Strength Switch, How the New Science of Strengths-Based Parenting Can Help Your Child and Teen to Flourish, on the Strength Switch website, which is strengthswitch.com. There you can also sign up to receive Lee's free strengths based parenting tip sheet, which I'm sure is an excellent resource. Jay and I have also put a link to her site, her book, her online program, and her social media profiles in the show notes for this episode, along with Lee's positive parenting tips and the other resources that we've mentioned today. And you'll find all of that at potential.com.au forward slash podcast. And if you'd like a copy of our very comprehensive and very free downloadable collection of over 130 parenting, performance and well-being tips from our podcast episodes that I've interviewed in seasons one through to three, you'll also find a link to download that guide at potential.com.au forward slash podcast or you can follow the podcast link on the home page menu it's a big button on the episode and show notes page you can't miss it so that will give you access instantly or as instantly as the internet will allow depending on what's happening with the internet at that moment and it's a little book there of 130 parenting or over 130 parenting performance and well-being tips that we've gathered from all of the wonderful experts that we've had on the show prior to the beginning of this season and while we're talking about positive parenting, my first ebook, The Positive Parenting Toolkit, is also available via the Potential Psychology website. And I do reference Lee's work in the book because it has been an inspiration to me, both as a psychologist but also as a parent. And you'll also find it a compilation of other of the biggest and best and most helpful positive parenting ideas that I've come across and researched and used myself with my family. So there's plenty of practical strategies and tips. I've tried to keep it easy to read and full of practical stuff that you can do to help your family to thrive in 2019. And it's on sale right now. So head to potential.com.au forward slash store. And you'll also find a link to that on the homepage at potential.com.au. If you have enjoyed today's episode and discussion with Lee Waters or you're enjoying the show in its entirety, please let us know. Give us a rating or a review in iTunes. 
to do that, if you're listening on an iPhone right now, the easiest way to do it is just scroll on down to the bottom of the list of potential psychology episodes and you should see a row of stars and you can click on the stars to rate. And if you scroll a little further, you'll see a link that says write a review. And I'd love it if you just pop your thoughts in there. I read and really appreciate every review, rating and comment as it helps to spread the word about the podcast and all of the amazing work of our guests. So what's coming up next week on the show? Well, we're talking stories and movies and how stories are linked to our understanding of ourselves and our well-being. And my guest is the very animated and passionate Anna Box, psychologist and story strategist. And this conversation is a lot of fun and I'm very keen to get to one of Anna's workshops now, having learned all about them. But here's a little sneak peek of what Anna has to say. Everything about how we thrive, whether it be an individual or a team or a tribe, it's all about that sort of human thriving and the human condition and and the role that stories play in helping people to anchor into what makes them do better or what makes them perform better or what takes them closer to their authentic self, which I think is more what we're sort of after these days than necessarily just a performance outcome. Thanks so much for listening. As always, have a great week and do go forth and fulfil your potential. I'll see you next week.